Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, our session is titled From Decoder Rings to Deep Fakes. Um, we hope that we can talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing at UJ Law Library to teach legal technology and give some ideas for things that we'd like to um, just discuss with you, what you're doing, that kind of thing. Um, before we get started, I know a few people came in late. I would love to walk around and hand out a handout if you can raise your hand. Um, and my name is Rachel, and this is Jason from UJ Law Library. Anybody else? So, uh, I think it's always important to kind of help manage expectations. So, so let's lay out the roadmap of what we're going to be talking about. Start with, I think, the biggest question, and this is something I, I think a lot of us who are very interested in talking about technology with students is, how do we kind of uh, translate very complex uh, topics into something that can be um, appreciated and kind of synthesized by law students. And I want to spend a lot of time talking about that. And then we'll kind of get into some topics that we've experimented with at UGA Law, have taught, have had some success, has had some incredible uh, not successes. And some things we're kind of meditating about, like, is this something we want to lean really into, or should we let this kind of technology mature? Things like blockchain, artificial intelligence, deep fakes, and quantum. But before we launch a little bit too far into this, we kind of want to understand who we're talking to. So we would love to take a poll from the audience on who are you? Um, if you if you can, if you have a device with you, if you could go to Poll Everywhere, P O L L E V dot com slash Rachel Evans one three three. Uh, if you have the app on your phone, you can get to it by just putting in Rachel Evans one three three. And we're going to use this a few different times throughout the presentation to just break things up a little bit and ask you, uh, poll the audience for a question of what you think about this. Um, so for our first one. Um, I think I know what it is. Uh, the first question is, and we've already got some suggestions coming in, that's great, is who are you? Are you IT, faculty, librarians, or uh, from another office at a law school? Who's going to tweet? Yeah. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> So, um, you can put us in guesses. We are, yes, we are librarians. <laughs> so, um, our results, we've got 29% IT, 59% uh, librarians, oop, 33% IT. Um, this is great. So, a bigger room of librarians, more than half of you are librarians. Um, there's some IT, and then there's a couple of faculty in here. So back. Um, I think that that says a lot about some of the things we're going to talk about. And one of our questions uh, later on in the session is going to deal with who do you think should be teaching this? Um, so that's one reason why we're asking you up front who you are, just to kind of get a read on the audience. So before we launch into that, I have a very belabored analogy that I kind of want to work through with everybody because I'm going through a bit of an existential crisis when it comes to teaching technology. And I kind of want to poll or just talk a little bit about, am I just going crazy? Am I, is my perspective really warped? Or is this something somebody, some other people are starting to experience? And just from the keynote and a couple of the sessions I've seen this morning, I'm getting that sentiment. So I'm like, so thank you for all, all for enabling my neuroses. This is very <laughs> empowering. So let's talk a little bit about cognition, shall we? Humans understand things in a linear fashion, right? We have time. It starts in the morning, it ends at the night, and we go from one to one to ten. It's things just progress naturally. But that's not the only way things advance, right? There's also things like blanking out the screen like that. Ah, the B button. You can also have exponential growth where things just rapidly, rapidly, rapidly increase. So why does that little menu seem 
So Welcome Robot Overlords, Please Don't Fire Us, is a Mother Jones article from 2013. Anybody super familiar with this one? Uh, we gave, so if there was anybody here at SEAL a couple months ago, this presentation might look very similar. This is the new and improved version, but when I brought this up, there were a couple nodding heads. I'm like, oh no, my wonderful analogy is ruined. But yeah, okay, so this is an article. We'll have the slides. You can follow the link. So, thought experiments. Uh, Lake Michigan. Anybody live near or around any of the Great Lakes? Okay. Awesome. I am originally from Buffalo, New York, so Lake Erie is my jam. I'm a big fan of Ontario. Best Great Lake? Lake Superior. Superior is superior. So, <laughs> let's presume that Michigan, Lake Michigan, is empty. We're going to fill it up. But we have a couple conditions about how we're going to fill it up. We're going to start in 1940, so we're going to jump into the DeLorean, head back. We're going to empty the lake, and we're going to start filling it up. But we're going to fill it up one ounce at a time. Ooh, that's going to take a minute. But we're going to wait. We have a stipulation that will improve this. We're going to double the amount of water we put into it every 18 months. So first, first time, one ounce. Second time, two ounce. Third time, four ounce. Anybody starting to see where we're going? OK. So let's take the timeline through here. It's going to take 60 years to get the bottom just like damp. It's like, ooh, might need to wear some boots. <laughs> After another 10 years, we're going to start seeing some puddles, you know, like, oh, just um, things that will probably evaporate in the sun for after too long. 10 years after that, we have 40 feet of water. Okay, that's not nothing. And then five years after that, the lake is full. So this is linear progression, and this is something that kind of tweaks your brain a little. It's just, it goes from nothing, nothing, whoa, whoa, and it's we're already over the top. So why was 1940 and doubling something every 18 months really important for us? Everybody, everybody knows the law. It's that Moore's Law. It's that thing how processing power doubles eight, every 18 months, right? I think that was the, is it the number of processors or just processing power? Uh, um, 1940s is when the computer chip was kind of was invented. There's specific data. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. It's fine. So let's jump. Let's use the same time frame. Uh, 60 years later, 2000s. We survived um, the Millennium Bug. Yes. <laughs> and we have things like laptops, PCs, internet, mobile phones. I mean, they were mobile phones, but they were like the Nokia's that could stop a bullet. Uh, flip phones are still a thing. 70 years. This is uh, 2010. You have smartphones, Wi-Fi, social media, all that really fun stuff. Like technology is never going to stop. It's never going to lie to us. It's never going to steer us wrong. We love tech. Let's keep going. Nine years later. Now, we got machine learning and AI, which is kind of redundant, but I less like like the concept. Uh, blockchain and so many new other things. Um, when we get to that 85 years, lake is full. That's going to be weird. 2025 is going to be messed up. I talk a lot about this because, so this is the part where I need you to tell me if I'm crazy or not. When I started my profession in like 2010, I just was struggling to explain to attorneys, this is what an app is. You can use an app to do cool things. And now I'm going and explaining, okay, you all want to know what meltdown is. Okay, let's see if we can't break down this, this process. Um, well, now you're asking about blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Like, uh, why are attorneys asking me about this? So I guess this is an informal question to the audience. Is the technology getting, there's the technology that we're expecting law students and lawyers and attorneys and judges and everybody that we're interacting with. It's getting more complex, right? The base level is getting higher and higher. I'm seeing people nod, no one's calling me out. I'm very excited. <laughs> because it's putting an it's an, an amount, and I you hear heard a little bit about that of that at the keynote and at some of the morning sessions that yes, it's really happening now. Um, before you would have to kind of struggle and argue with your administration, like no, we need to get tech into the classrooms. Like yeah, whatever. That's that's is it going to get us up on that blasted ranking? No, then leave. And now it's like, hey, you just get, get, bring the tech in. No, teach more, please. So how to do it? 
Um, and now we're just going to kind of launch into, you know, actually, why are we teaching our students? Well, it's kind of our job, right? Um, this, is, this is our jam. We are very well equipped. We have the knowledge about the law. We have the uh, knowledge about the, te uh, the technology. You're at Cali. I'm kind of presuming, but I don't think that's too much of a jump. Um, that blasted Rule 8, I can practically recite it from memory now. It's that one about competency. It's just, I'm going to write a paper. Uh, and just Like, what is the origins of that competency comment? Because it's really just kind of changed a lot of things. It's marketing. I mean, it looks great when you can say, when you just look at some of the cool schools. Um, was it Oklahoma, Chicago, Kent? Um, oh, who's got the, 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 the competency like us? Anyway, and it's kind of the new normal. This is like tech competency, whatever version, whether that's you know word styles and email etiquette or being able to just navigate time and bit, time entry or a, uh, uh, an office or practice management system uh, fluently. So, and the last time we presented this, I got a lot of, I got a bit of pushback, like, why is it mostly the librarians that are being asked to teach? Like, are there any librarians in the crowd who are, who are kind of teaching formally or informally this kind of topic? I'm seeing some nods, I'm seeing some hands, okay. Um, why is it on us? Or why is it on the library? Or, well, actually, no, let's take it back. Are there any faculty or adjuncts here that are teaching technology to... Okay, cool. Um, and the poll and the poll everywhere right now, I helped some of you connect. Um, if you closed it for a second and you want to join in again, is legal technology being taught at your institution? And it looks like 57% uh, of you in this room right now say that it is being taught, so great. That's, that, and that's tremendous. And you, that, 64. It's, that number's only going to be going <laughs> up, right? Is there, can we, can we imagine a law school in 2025 that's not going to be talking about technology in, just in some capacity? I sincerely doubt about maybe, you know, like we could hit the singularity really early and the robots could just wipe us all out. So if this is being recorded and reviewed by, um, like, Metal or silicon based sapiens. <laughs> we had a good run. <laughs> so here's the one that I think is the most interesting to everybody is like, how are we going to be teaching our students? And that's how I want to take a lot of time to kind of di discuss it. Oh, there's playing an animation. <laughs> so, and anybody familiar with this? What's going on in, in this little slide? RFID implants. RFID implants. I think it's the way that Sweden or Switzerland that there's like a bunch of people who just like can do high five, I Venmo you. That's like, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> um, so the venue is probably the most, it's the threshold, I think, is finding a, meeting the students where they are and We've had a tremendous amount of sex success with uh, informal uh, instruction. It's, and it's, the, it's the typical, uh, you know, show up for half an hour, we'll give you pizza, and you might learn something. Uh, partnering with student organizations has proven really well, proven really effective. Um, I'd say that, in my experience, uh, we just started teaching, the librarians just started teaching all of the legal research baseline. So, all of the librarians now interact with the, with every single law student has interacted with a librarian in an instructional uh, capacity. So now, like, we can go to, hey, student presidents, uh, student gov student government presidents, can we get in front of your organization for a minute? Um, of course, the best one of the best things you do is just have a doctrinal class, right? Whether it's one credit or two credit or three credits. Um, how many people are, have a one credit course going? That's, what, that's us. We have a one credit course. It's not nearly enough. Two credit courses? Cool. Full three credit jobs? Okay. One back there. Um, and this is the poll right now, too. I just switched it over. So informal sessions. Mostly informal sessions? Okay. Oh. Huh? That? We're actually mostly four credit, but 
There's some of you doing some other I'm um, kind of and certificate programs out there somewhere. So Rachel and I actually did a certificate program back when Casey Flaherty was making his big push for the legal tech audits. And how we did six presentations, uh, three pre presentations twice. Uh, how many people actually got the certificate? Two. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work, a lot of effort, but and we what, did it over the course of an entire spring semester. But this was so, like what, 2014, 15? Two thousand spring 2015. Spring 2015. So, and now. You actually, I, I think there was that session this morning with um, the NSLT folks kind of talking about how they had rolled out their, uh, their product into actually full-fledged courses and in, in part of the curriculum. And that's exciting to me because it means it's, even though we've been kind of like, in 2015, like, oh my God, this was a failure. Let's just get on with competency and never touch it again. And, and, and it just kept rolling. So the momentum is building. It's that exponential growth, I guess breaking it down. I don't think this is the most important, but it is the most challenging. It's identifying topics and then what are the things that you want students. I think that's the most, the overriding thing in, so this is something I picked up from one of my um, instructional mentors. It's that maybe you don't need to actually get into the actual details. Do you need students to sit and watch you know, like a, some Bitcoin being mined, you just sit there and watch the progress bar and like look at those numbers go. Maybe that's useful, um, or is it more valuable that for them to kind of understand? You don't need to know what going on, going what's going on with the hash, but maybe you need to know what understand what a hash is. Do you need to know Python? Do you need to know Ruby? Do you need to know JavaScript? There are people who are teaching their law students programming languages, and I. Tremendously, uh, anybody here from Vermont? I know that, I know, um, I think it was at the ABA Tech Show and someone was talking about how they spend a summer teaching law students how to code. And I got really excited, but like, man, I don't know if I could teach law students how to code. But what is about it. about UNC? Is anybody here from UNC? I know they are teaching Git in their legal tech Wait, really? class. Yeah. Okay. So, um, very small, you know, just bringing somebody into the classroom, like, sharing about it and I think the idea behind some of that is less about teaching them you know teaching them to be a coder or to be you know like a systems admin but more about just letting them talk intelligently about this um, and the fact that you know we're preparing them now maybe even next year but they need to be ready for talking about things intelligently in five years when they're you know new lawyers so um, just getting them to know how to talk about it I think that part of that is asking people to step back and here's what you think you know and here's what you should know. And I, this really comes into play with artificial intelligence because people are expecting, you know, Skynet or Hail, and it really is, you know, Google. So helping people kind of deconstruct their preconceptions or it's not that complicated if you look at all of the things that are going on in quantum computing. Well, actually, no, that's a big fat lie. Quantum computing is really complicated, but I mean, there's ways of stepping back, digesting, and you do, do they need to know what a floating qubit is or some of these, I forget the terminology, uh, or is it that this is something that can churn through numbers really fast is going to kind of revolutionize the way certain things are processed. That's all you really need to say. It's going to be super fast for some things. Oh yeah, AI versus what it actually is. So, starting with, I wonder if there's anything else I need to say. I think this might be a good place to stop for questions, if anybody, because we're going to get into some ex actual examples of things we've taught, broken down, and have had some success and some spectacular failures. Uh, but before we move on, I was just wondering if people would like to talk a little bit about the how or the why of taking, because that's really the, the, the focus of, the, of the, uh, the presentation, is to talk a little bit about, or a lot about, um, sorry, am I going crazy? You're going great. I was laughing at our final poll question I just activated. You guys are on top of it because you are interacting really great. So, um, who is best suited, in your opinion, to teach legal technology? This is 
very much in line with what you were oh, sort yeah. of getting at. Um, no one has responded. Fa oh, there it is. I was about to say, no one has responded. Faculty, librarians and adjuncts, librarians, adjuncts, and IT are still holding very strong. Um, and faculty is the, the low runner. So, you know, maybe have, we can have, this is a great time in our conversation before we get into some of those specific examples of why do we think that? Why do we think that as you all in the audience being made up of, you know, there's a variety of people here. So, um, why do we feel like librarians and uh, adjuncts are more suited than faculty members or even IT staff? Yes. I would say, I don't know between you know, librarians and adjuncts. But one thing about librarians is, you know, the idea is you get to know all the students. I mean, it's it's something, it's not that you happen to take one faculty member who, you know, includes it in his or her class, or one adjunct who might include something in the class. But, you know, it can be a school-wide program that the librarians are, are working on. And that seems to be very popular, too, to bring um, not even adjuncts, but members of the IT into a classroom. And that's exactly what Jason has been doing with our IT director. Um, they're co-teaching along with another librarian, and, that has, and he's been an equal teacher in that class. And I think that's provided a lot of interesting you know, dynamics so that somebody can talk very well about some of the subject matter that um, there is sort of an expert in the room for some of the stuff while there's a librarian who's very well versed in the research aspects for other topics. And that's the way I'm in IT at Northwestern and Jesse the tech librarian we, he has he does the law practice technology class and I'll come in for cybersecurity or AI or anything, things along those lines. And you as well? Um, I, in my ideal world I want it to be team I want a librarian and I want doctrinal faculty to come in and I want the IT person in there and um, you know adjuncts who are specialists so I mean for the one class I've taught so far I was able to get our e-discovery adjunct and I was able to track down some legal hackers I know to talk about cybersecurity and password managers mm -hmm. but I, I don't need to be the instructor in the class. I want to be the facilitator of multiple instructors. More of like a curated them. classroom. Yes. Okay. I'm not an expert in blockchain, and I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I think one of the issues is, are you going to teach a class? Because then the students have to actually sign up for the class, which means they're not signing up for another class they might want. So that's why I was talking about the librarians. If you do something, I mean, I just went to a session where they were talking about pop-ups, you know, and how to get some of this technology, but to kind of, because you really want to have all the students to be exposed rather than the ones who think they actually know they want to see this. And so, I mean, I think that's the, how do you do it? It's more than just getting a class. And then, it, it, you know, getting everybody to come in who are the experts. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but, you know, how are you going to do it? And what are you going to do? Right. Are you going to talk about the PDF redaction, or are you going to, you know, talk about blockchain? I mean, we're talking with your Lake Michigan. You've now got so much more technology to, to introduce people to, so much more water, so much more technology than you had before. This is what this is what actually gives me little panic attacks is, okay, so I need to teach them about word styles, and I need to teach about outlook filters, and I need to teach about blockchain, and I need to teach about the different versions of machine learning. Okay, that's all one class, one credit class, right? There's the, the what technology constitutes competency, what technology constitutes something that is nice to know what level of understanding and uh, just actual skill with something constitutes competency. Is it just being able to do it once? Is it being able to do it under pressure? Is it being able to teach others? There's a lot going on and I think the most important thing is getting your foot in the door. I don't know if you have to go in front of your, um, your curriculum committee and pitch uh, classes. Um, we're blessed and 
well, let's go with blessed that at our institution, <laughs> if we even muse out loud near one of the deans, hey, wouldn't this be cool? When can you start? Oh, um, maybe. <laughs> it's you, we have to be very careful about the things we are offering, so we get to offer a lot of stuff. So that's not a problem for us, but it's just how do we get now? The question is how do we grow the one credit into a two or three? Um, I'm gonna can move. I, can yes, I, I'm sorry. So, no, it's okay. So, how do you balance? Because going back to kind of what you were saying, um, I think it was called the Yurka question. So, like, if we have all this water. We're trying to teach about all this water. What about the water that's legal research traditionally? If you're a librarian, if you want to ramp something out for the whole, all the kids, yes. you know, do you still have the capacity as a library staff to both run a library and potentially also be teaching standard legal research? Like, what is the United States Code and how does that get published? And what is it used for? It's. I think there's actually a really nice venues now that you're seeing some more interesting tools being integrated into things like what is it, Edge is, is a really good way of doing a little bit of legal research and we can talk about AI now. Um, same things for the things that are kind of getting baked into Lexus. Was it Ravel? Ravel. Yeah. Uh, so that's really nice. Um, we have a slide just for those things in a moment. Yeah, right. <laughs> so this is a little game I like to play. Is it internet? I, I, there's this weird resurgence of memes from like 10 years ago, so I think we're all catching this one, right? Um, or is it the QR code? Is this something that is fundamentally changing the way, this technology that just changes, like a sea change? Or is it technology that was like, oh, that's kind of cute for like 18 months and then no one ever uses it ever again? I mean, some people are using QR codes, but at one point our library was decked to the nines in little strange little cubes and, and no one ever touched those things. So. This is, this is also part of the technology that would like, is this something that absolutely needs to be taught or is this something that's a flash in the pan? So my favorite, is this fundamental or is this a flash in the pan? Blockchain. Because I go back and forth every month about whether this is something that's going to revolutionize the world or I wish would just go away already and stop filling up my news feed. What do you uh, all think? That's actually, yeah, I'm just genuinely curious. How, how many, just a, a regular show of hands, because we don't have a poll for this one, but how many think that this is, uh, you know, QR code? Nobody. 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 Well, uh, 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 no, no, no I, don't, I don't think it's QR code, but I think, so the interesting thing is, uh, you know, not a lawyer. Sure. Uh, <laughs> IT. But one thing that I've noticed, you know, with lawyers, in general is, you know, when we come to lawyers, we need help, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's the understanding, you, you know, the lawyer is the expert at getting me hopefully out of whatever legal trouble I have managed to get myself into. But what we're finding is I know more than the lawyer as far as the technology that may be in question, right? right? And so our goal at our, you know, at our school right now is how do we get our students to a level where they can understand, yeah. you know, right, what the client is trying to explain right. and then translate that to, okay, did you actually break the law or not? You know, was this innocent? Was yeah. it, how are we going to explain this, you know, in front of a jury, if it's even a jury, it could just be a torts case, right? right? Or things like that. So as far as blockchain, that does not seem to be going away anytime soon, but could I potentially do something with blockchain that will get me in front of a judge in trouble? Uh, maybe? Maybe. So what do we do about that, right? And right. I think that's why like what everyone was saying, like tag team teaching makes a lot of sense because wow. there are those who are constantly in the field, but you guys have the legal knowledge. Like you guys know how to format stuff so judges don't just kick us out because we misnumbered a page, right? Like it's definitely a partnership it seems. I'm starting to, oh, okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I, actually, I, just, I think it's an interesting question of do we need to teach them which technologies do we actually need to teach mm -hmm. them and which techno how do we need to teach them to learn about technologies? Mm. When I'm thinking back was I was either blessed or cursed to grow up with a mother who was a lawyer. Mm. Oh, yeah. And she handled a huge case that came down to the design of airplane windows. I can guarantee you, when she started that, she knew nothing about the engineering mm -hmm. specifications for Boeing airplane windows. And by the end of that case, she was an expert in wow. Boeing airplane windows. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, she didn't need to, in her law school didn't need to teach her how an airplane window was constructed. Mm -hmm. And so it may be that my law school doesn't need to teach a student how <coughs> whatever this stuff is works. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know? How to make it. But what we need to teach them is how do you figure out something that you don't know anything about? Mm -hmm. Where do you go? What do you learn? How do you, under, how do you have the analytical skills to figure out something new? I think thought I saw one more hand, but oh yeah. Um, I was going to say regarding QR codes, I'm going to vote in favor of blockchain being like QR codes because if you use your phone at the airport, <coughs> the QR code that has all of your boarding information is actually true, fairly important, very true, and it's fairly useful. It's just in a limited context. Yes. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, that. So QR codes one. are useful, but they're not ubiquitous, and that's the problem with blockchain right now. You know what? I think I'm going to re rethink my analogy. That's a way better <laughs> understanding. Because I've seen some like, wait, I like QR codes. Some kind of looks from the people in the audience. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> but now I get it. That is, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go back and rethink my entire understanding because that is a really good point. I live and die by that digital boarding pass. So that's, I, this is something I really love because because you're going to you're really teaching students how to learn mm -hmm. and you're using technology as the catalyst. So really that's the that's where you have to kind of flex your pedagogical muscle, right? It's how many details are enough to keep the students engaged while still sparking that curiosity that um, you don't need to know how to program, but you need to know how to communicate with a programmer, I think is the most useful skill. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why this interdisciplinary approach just has me super psyched for the future because we're get, I mean, like we're starting to get like joint uh, appointments between what Georgia State has, the analytics and law school thing going on. We're seeing partnerships between business schools and programming and law schools that are reaching out to tech incubators and saying, what, we have a need and you have tech and skills and let's smash things together and come up with something for our, for our um, indigent populations. We can do something, to, but we don't need to teach students how to you know, compile. We just need to get them to translate the law into a you know a, a flow chart that a, that a program, programmer can understand. Man, I lost my train of thought. Um, it's a great spot to go into the. AI. Yes, let's do that, shall we? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, this goes to what we were saying. I mean, a little bit. What we wanted to do is just go through a few sort of micro lessons of you know are these things that we should be teaching or not? Just like we did with the blockchain. Um, a lot of times, as Jason was saying, so I need to teach them uh, what are the different types of machine learning. So I need to teach them what they think, the difference between what they think AI is and what it really is and how they are already using it, probably in multiple things that they do every day without even thinking about it. It's, it's actually very similar to that. You know, you're using the QR code. You don't really think about it. You go and you use it. It's in a limited context and you're not even... The students, maybe they're using this a lot more than they know, but they don't know how to talk about mm -hmm. what's behind it, what makes it work. Um, and to get into them this sort of spirit that hopefully they will carry on into their careers, that they just need to be good at translating it. You know, translating this, this was a, something that you said the other day, Jason, sort of the esoteric into the practical, like bring it over into practice. You know, we want to get them practice ready, but um, they just need to be able to talk about it intelligently. So. I will say that we just finished up our spring law for technology for the practice of law class and we asked students to pick a topic and then write a couple pages about it and then have a conversation with the rest of the students. Half the class, just with no prompting from us, from the instructors whatsoever, wrote about some variation of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. They know it's coming down the pipe. And because they're seeing those headlines like robot lawyers are coming for your job and they're doing it way better than you, ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> Uh, um, what 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 is it? The UN AI that just tran that the UN attorneys versus the AI um, like contract um, translator like the trans the translator AI did it in like 15 minutes and had like 97 percent perfection where it took the attorney six hours and they only had 93 percent. Ah, take that carbon based life. Um, 
<laughs> Let's move on to the next slide, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> so the handouts that I've given to each of you, I think everyone's got one in the room at this point. If you don't, feel free to raise your hand. We've got plenty we can give you later if you want extra copies to take back with you. Um, not only are some of the things that we mentioned earlier in the presentation about just possible venues for uh, teaching this, some ideas, but uh, I also wanted to throw out some interesting sort of um, AI and deep learning tools that might be good entry points for your classroom. Let's say you're just going to do like a one-off session and see if students are interested. Sometimes it's a good way, I know for me personally, I like uh, discovering that there's a tool that I like to play with that I view as more of a game or, you know, just like a little app that all of a sudden I realize, oh, that's using, you know, some deep learning. And then that gives you the opportunity for those students while they're having fun and realizing how there's this tool that they don't even really know how it works is actually an example of something that they may need to gain a bigger understanding of and that could affect their future. Um, so here's just a few. I mean, has anybody used uh, Is Your Portrait in a Museum app before? Huh? All right. This is a fun one. Um, like a lot of those funky little apps, you take a picture of yourself, uh, fair warning, I actually do not take pictures of myself and feed it into apps, but you can at your own <laughs> Who knows if it's saving or not? It's, it'll tell you it's not, but who knows? Um, it will match your face with a portrait from a huge database of museum um, pieces. And sometimes the likeness is very good. It might be really famous. You know, you have the face or the chin or something of, you know, popular Renaissance woman or something. So um, another cool one that I really, really love, um, and by the way, that might be a good entry point to, like, talking, having a discussion with your students about facial recognition, maybe the implications of that, how that's being used in the legal context. So there's a lot of pathways that you could take to, to draw this back into um, the legal education, legal classroom. Um, but uh, what was the other one? This, this fun one at the bottom is Colorize, Colorize SG. Um, that's a really neat one that we've actually used in the law library to automatically colorize some photos that were black and white or sepia toned. And so the way this one works, it's really quick and easy. Again, it says it's not going to save your photo. Hopefully it won't. This is a photo from our law school, um, from a law school classroom in the 40s. And I was able to add some really lifelike color. So the more pictures that you feed this, every time it's learning how to pick out the backgrounds, you know, the colors um, of the outdoors or the indoors, and of course people's faces and things like that. And it's colorizing it for you based on what it's learned. So the more you go and give it a photo, the better it gets at its job. And um, over here on the far right, does anyone know who painted this portrait? Was that the computer one? It's a computer generated portrait, yeah. So this, this portrait was painted, this is the, the signature of said uh, artist which is actually just a program that um, was fed a lot of paintings and was able to, you know, put out a, a very realistic looking portrait um, that if you remove that, you know, you might think, oh, let me track that down and figure out who it was. But another example of a, of a machine doing this, so. Robot. <laughs> hey. no, robots. No, that's not commentary. This is actually robots doing stuff. Yes, so who has seen this particular video here? Is anyone familiar with this video of, of Trump uh, giving a speech um, about uh, how people should do, no one, no one knows? We, how well we have one, right? This actually isn't Trump. It looks a little believable though. So you can imagine seeing this on Twitter and uh, it's on your device and it's really small and even blown up here pretty big, it doesn't necessarily look fake, right? Um, so deep fakes are another one of those technologies that it's, it's fairly new. Uh, it's, as with most technologies, it's going to rapidly get better. So you can take, this is actually how it works on the top right, you can take the input uh, source and the input target and you can map someone else's face, you can do this with the voice, and you can make a very believable um, very, very believable fake video of someone. So you can see how this um, maybe not in our too distant future, perhaps in a you know political campaign of some sort, could be used in, in nefarious ways by other people. Um, and you can share this with your classroom. I mean, if a student 
happens to go before someone and they need to prove whether or not a piece of evidence is real or not, they need to know that there are way, very good ways of, of faking it. Yeah. So. Now, I, 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 I was really turned on to the legal ramifications of deepfakes by uh, there's a student who was writing a note about the prospect of using, I think it was copyright for makeup patterns as a way of combating potential deepfake videos. Because if you can claim, because there's some stipulation how you can't use your, vi your, your visage, but you can maybe use the, your, the makeup pattern that you've applied as a way of kind of getting around that. So speaking of deep fakes, I think it's really important to talk about this person. Do you know who this is? Anybody? Anybody want to take a guess? It's because that person ain't real. This is a computer-generated person. It's my favorite. This, um, this person does not exist. Dot com. <laughs> just go in. Just hit F five a couple times. You get a new person every time, and it's getting better and better because it used to be all white people. And now, and now you're seeing, seeing way more ethnic diversity. Sometimes you can kind of tell, like, their eyes don't match. And sometimes you get, like, yeah, that's a real person for sure. And they're like, no, it's a composite of four different kind of features, all working through the, the magic of, oh, gosh. So the way that this was trained, uh, the, this program was trained with more than 70,000 pictures of human faces. Uh, basically, uh, for the purposes of proving that it was possible for a program to build entirely from scratch new faces that are believable, um, and it's it's a gener generative adversarial network again, and it's not just for people. You can do this with cars and bedrooms. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you can do it with cats. Oh. <laughs> The so perfect computer generated you can reimagine real life, <laughs> and again, you can see how this uh, this very quickly is evolving. And you know, with a lot of things, I don't think that it's necessarily that a lot of technologies are inherently bad, or they're developed by people with purposes for something um, sort of sinister. But uh, it just depends on who's using it, who gets their hands on it. This type of thing can be used. By anyone and and do there need to be you know that's another conversation maybe to have with students why is it important to talk about it well a lot of these things that are new we don't have a lot of framework for how to treat them with the law so do laws exist to you know deal with this if somebody uses it in the wrong way I'm so happy you brought up the cat thing because now we get to talk about quantum physics <laughs> the perfect segue um, so yes, quantum computing is really fun because you have ones and zeros computing, right? Quantum, in, quantum computing introduces the yes bit, where it is, is it a one or is it a zero? Yes. It just kind of floats in quantum space being whatever it needs to be, and then it just, you, crazy maths happen and you find the most optimal way of calculating something and then it just like it phases that and then it figures out if that, and that little bit is dead or not and then pops it right into the equation. It doesn't do everything super fast, but it does do math, like scary fast. So I'm just imagining you start feeding in a lot of this crazy um, like judge or decision analytics, huge amounts of data, uh, just feed it into a quantum computer, let it churn through it, and then get an AI to kind of parse out the, like the really, really interesting little details of it, have somebody train it for a bit, and then you've got this crazy homunculus of like weird maybe not dead cats telling you to go talk to that judge in New Jersey because your cop because your yo know, claims is going to go really well if you use this pronoun like that's the kind of craziness that we're going to be getting to and but do I need to sit and talk about all of that or do I, is that the analogy I need to use and this is walk away from the actual quantum physics of it for the students do they just need to know it's cool and it might be coming down the pipe this is, the, this is my big pie in the sky. Like, I've been really interested in quantum for a while, and it's, we're still working on it. I think there's like 80 qubits in the world, these crazy bits, but there's more and more every day. So let's talk about how to put the into practice, shall we? Yeah. Just for so, a while. Again, going back to that, um, do students really know what we're talking about when we're talking about AI? I mean, so many of the tools that librarians are already using and that people in practice are already using 
that they may not realize what types of artificial intelligence are going on behind it. I just, we just wanted to point out some of the things that you may already be using with your students that they are probably already using without even realizing uh, the types of things that go into it. So in Lexus, we've got um, Lex Machina, we've got Intelligize, Ravel Law, um, there's Westlaw Edge, and then there's a lot of startup contenders that we're actually a little curious as to who in the room, those of you that are you know, teaching some of these tools, like which ones do you think are important? What's the next one that people are going to use? Um, case text, we've had a couple of sessions at the law school, I know, where we had case text come in and share that with our students. Um, Gavalytics, Ross Intelligence, and Lisa was the last one I think that you shared with me. Lisa, robot lawyer, yes. So, but I completely forgot all the details about Are there any much. others that anyone in the room that we didn't mention that you think are important to share with students or that you're using? Do we kind of hit the big ones? Well, I was just thinking, I think it's more than saying, you know, you know, these products use it. It's you have to go, you know, under the hood and do some talking because they need to understand what it is because otherwise they just get very happy and say oh it's smarter than i am i put my terms in and i come up with the answer does anybody know the name oh yeah so i was just going to say um i don't know if it counts as an ai war of legal research but i really very much appreciate um mary's error of the day um oh yeah Lib, yeah yep yep if you mary matus like yep. sends a message on law Lib pretty much every day and it's a mistake on Lexus or Westlaw mm -hmm. or Fastcase or Bloomberg or whatever. I actually don't know that I've seen one from Fastcase before. Mm. But it's Lexus, Westlaw, Bloomberg. And every, there's some guy, I think in New Jersey, who, who like will write in like, well, it's a, it's a coding problem. And like, the, you know, we all kind of know like that mistake is an iteration of a coding problem. The point I is, the system has a coding problem, <laughs> and like you know, there's all kind of, like things like that. Like I actually think are interesting, and I use that in my teaching just so people can see that there are mistakes, and like yeah. garbage in is garbage out, and really, mm -hmm. what do you get from you know how much can you trust? Like when Westlaw makes a mistake or when Lexus makes a mistake. And I'm really excited. I forget the name of the of the product, but Fastcase has that new. A uh, artificial intelligence sandbox that they're kind of be, they're going to be rolling out in the near future, and I think that's the perfect way for students to get actually really get their hands on and make mistakes and see all the dumb stuff that computers can do. Like they're so smart, no, they're really dumb, but they're really good at following instructions, though. Yeah, exactly. They're only as smart as you are. <laughs> so far, thankfully. Um, <laughs> So I'm just going to launch into this uh, this little example that I was really proud of for the blockchain presentation that we did. And I think 90% of the success was the title was How to Get Filthy Rich with Blockchain. <laughs> the very first slide is you can't. So I got gotcha you for the next 40 minutes. Um, well done. The, uh, I, I wish I could give that presentation over and over again. So part of talking about blockchain is talking about cryptography. And cryptography is a very, when, when you get it, you get it. But until you get it, it's just weird, especially when you start talking about public private key encryption. So what is cryptography? It's the art of writing or solving codes. And then encryption is the process of kind of turning that into using that as a way of kind of protecting things. So we're talking about public key, private key. I'm like, all right, uh, what's the most well-known, almost universally understood version of public private key encryption in media in the United States? Because I'm fairly sure most of us have seen a Christmas story. Little Orphan Annie is, the, is what I bring up. It's like, okay. What's the public key? It's that broadcast saying B, 13, C, whatever, and then like, okay, here we go, here we go, here we go, and what's the private key? It's the, it's the decoder ring, right? So yeah, so it's, you just phrase it like that, and you have your lesson. Um, there was a lot more going on with that, but just the, I actually had a couple students saying like, that makes sense, that, and, <laughs> The process of getting from, okay, let's take the 
let's look at cryptocurrency, let's look at the, the various constituent parts of it because it's not just blockchain. There's a couple other things going on there, but you really want to look at blockchain and there's a couple things going on there. So you have to look at encryption and just the various mediums, what does mining look like, where does the processing power come from, all of these things. There's a lot to go on and so it's really just, okay, let's pull it back and explain this like a normal human being because the people, like, has Nakamoto's identity ever been confirmed to be real or not? So you're never going to be able to pick that person's brain, but we kind of understand. So it's on us to synthesize, learn, and put it back. Or even better, partner with people who do know all of this stuff already and bring them in and have them talk. You can Skype them in. You can Zoom them in. You can drive them in. You can talk with them on the phone and learn things. It's, I'm, my understanding about this topic is evolving as I present about this, which is kind of weird, but hey, um, that's what learning is, right? So we were told to leave 10 minutes for questions. So yeah, thanks everybody. You've been a tremendous audience. Any questions, comments, concerns? You're wrong. <laughs> I'm waiting for that one, so. Yes. How do you deal with imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. in dealing with all these high tech issues that you don't feel expert in, and yet you're trying to pass on enough knowledge so that if someone wants to become an expert later on, yeah. they'll have a good grounding. Hmm. I'm going to put this up to Rachel first. Um, I think that um, going back to one of our very early questions that we asked a couple times throughout, which I think is a fluid one, which may be changing um, as you know time passes, uh, but obviously with this audience, I think that we feel like librarians are best suited, if not to teach it, then at least to curate it. Um, and I think that goes to feeling comfortable in the classroom about topics that you are not an expert in, right? I mean, that's, that's what a librarian is. Librarians are more like generalists, you know? They have to, um, their, their be best skill is finding out about something, becoming an expert in something when the need arises. And doing that sort of, you know, as needed, ad nauseum, every time a new question comes. And it's to the example of, you know, your mom being the lawyer and like, she had to go in and figure that out, right? Um, she didn't know what it would be probably the day before, but that happens. And I think librarians are really well suited to do that because that's kind of how we're trained. So whether you're just a librarian or um, like a law librarian, you still have that set of sort of research skills. And I think that's what poises them really well to um, not be the expert, but figure out enough to be an expert enough to not just gather the resources, but the people to like come into the classroom. So I think just being resourceful. Uh, so even if you're not the librarian, maybe put on the librarian hat and say, what are the resources that I have? Well, I have an IT department with a systems admin. Let's see what they know about, you know? Um, or what are the resources that I have in adjuncts who are teaching maybe, uh, what was the one example, an e-discovery course, you know, mm -hmm. pull them in. Um, Maybe just some local attorneys who have dealt with a particular case that might be on point for a certain topic, and you could bring them into the classroom. So um, I, I think just being resourceful is probably the best answer, because nobody's ever going to feel comfortable being the expert in something they're not an expert in, but maybe just you know forfeiting that, not trying to be the imposter, but just being resourceful. So, I'll give hope a, that answers the question. I'll give a short, I'll give my interpretation is, um, well, I, I deal with an anxiety disorder, so I'm, I have coping method, methods, so from the, from the stresses of imposter syndrome, syndrome, I embrace the fear. It's really, that, that tension is what actually drives me to learn about the stuff. So, that, that's a weird thing for me that I need to have something looming over me like that. So imposter syndrome has served me very well in that regard in terms of being, the, fear is a wonderful motivator for me, which is not as useful for everybody. So I think, listen to Rachel's answer. But I thought I would chime in. Any other questions about any of the topics? Maybe just some ideas or maybe a topic that you've taught in one of your courses that we didn't touch on here. One of those sort of micro lessons that you think, you know, deserves a spot in a four credit course. 
You know what? Oh. Here's a random question. Sure. What do you guys read or look at or follow to stay up to date with tech? I relish the fact that I can just sit on Reddit for like an hour and say that was my job. I'm staying up to date. Um, we do have on the handout um, a couple that you may already be aware of. These are just sort of go-to. They're not any like top secret ones. But the bottom left corner, um, there's just sort of that learn more legal tech news, um, technoids, ABA Tech Show, um, The Artificial Lawyer. There's, there's some things out there. And you go to one, and one will inevitably lead you to another that's probably a source that you can, you know, follow and sort of gather your own little set of resources that can kind of feed these ideas to you. you it's just a matter of keeping up with what Silicon Valley tech bros are getting most excited about because that's usually kind of an indicator of what's coming down the pipe. Like if, if there's VC money behind it, it's going to be pushed down our throats so it might as well learn about it, right? Um, that's, that's, and, and these conferences are the best for that. I remember uh, Phil from Fastcase playing a little video of quantum computing. Like the, the computer sounds like it's singing when it's operating. It's incredible. Um, so that was, that's what got me super interested. So, I mean, you're here. You have done an, an enormous part in terms of learning about all of the cool stuff that we're, everybody's doing. So we have, the, we have Technoids, we have Wallet, we have all these great resources of like, we build that network and it's great. Um, man, that was a way more touchy-feely answer than I was expecting to give, but hey. <laughs> I'd also want to mention too, we didn't, um, we didn't really spend a lot of time on it because I feel like it's the kind of thing that gets spent a lot of time on, a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but just that tech competency, let's say you're at an institution and you are not um, teaching this yet, and you maybe need to start, you need something that's going to help you make the argument for having your first informal session or having your first series of like lunch and learns like we did way back when when we were doing just the legal tech audit. Um, the, there is a guide that I have linked to in that bottom left corner of the handout as well. Um, the guides, our CLE 2019, one of our colleagues, uh, Sharon Bradley, who's also here, not in the session, but she's here at Cali as well. She has an excellent guide that she has created. Um, and it, it talks all about comment eight, due diligence. Um, it's got links to all the resources for, not just for Georgia, but out to some other states as well. So. Um, I encourage you to check that out if you're looking for something to point to to say this is why students need to know it and this is why they need to get better at these skills now because we do believe that those types of requirements and those sort of standards for lawyers is only going to increase over time as we saw with technology increasing exponentially. I think that you know we need to teach them to be more competent in these areas at that same rate so um, there's that. Any other questions? Great. Oh, yeah, you might. 